And we're back. Fantastic. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's Wednesday once more, and that means it's uh, Read Z Live, Read Z's ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write uh, and publish better books. Uh, those of you who have been watching these for a while will know that uh, this is First Line Frenzy, uh, our ongoing series where we bring on uh, editor Rebecca Heyman and she reviews first lines uh, submitted by you, the viewers. Uh, it could be a short story, it could be a novel, it could be a piece of creative nonfiction, as long as it's sort of narrative and designed to capture uh, a reader's uh, attention. Uh, we want to hear it and we want to uh, uh, share it with everyone and sort of talk about it and see uh, how we can improve uh, the openings uh, of your stories. Uh, of course, uh, it's just a minute or two before the hour. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, I'm part of the ReadZ team based here in London. Uh, if you're not familiar, ReadZ is a marketplace uh, for publishing professionals where anybody uh, can reach out and contact and work with some of the best publishing professionals in the world. Uh, so that's editors, uh, line editors, book cover designers, interior designers, marketers. Uh, if you need professional help to publish a book, uh, you can likely find the right people here. Uh, first of all, I'm seeing so many people pour in. Really uh, grateful that you're joining us for this today. Uh, you know, we've got a lot to get through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in Becca now and then uh, we'll try to get things started. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Becca Heyman. Becca, how are you doing? I am doing great. How are you? Yeah, not bad. I got my first uh, Moderna jab yesterday. So I'm very nice. pleased. I'm, I am House of Pfizer, but I think we can still be friends. Um, I believe we're yeah, Bannerman. <laughs> yeah, we're better. So I've been actually fully vaxxed for over a month and it's been great. And I had absolutely no side effects for either job other than a really sore arm. I don't know how your arm is doing. It's a bit sore. My arm was really sore, but other than that, nothing. And I was sure I was so, I was so sure that I would really get, you know, feverish and chills and like the, all of these side effects. And I was almost as a busy mom, like looking forward to the forced break and yeah. I had no symptoms. I, I, was, was, like, I was looking forward to okay, having a day of just watching television, but that didn't come through. Yeah. I was like, I lined up some audiobooks. I was like, I'm just going to lay there and like kind of be in this like, you know, half fevered state. I'm just going to re-listen to some books, but it did not, did well, not work out for me. Enough Vax chat. Uh, we've got a lot to get through. Uh, first of all, Becca, would you like to introduce uh, w w what the deal is? What is the deal? Uh, okay, so the deal is First Line Frenzy um, is a community learning project, uh, which is code for we all learn together, which means if we invariably don't get to your line because we got over 2000 submissions for this event, uh, there's still a lot to learn from um, here and there are a lot of people to grow with. Uh, I want to discourage you from just spamming the comment feed with your first line looking for feedback because that means you are not actually listening to this broadcast. Uh, so I hope that you will really engage and join me in, in really parsing these lines, which I've never seen before, and, and just trying to see what works and what doesn't and trying to articulate some of those um, almost ineffable qualities that draw us in to the first line of a novel or you know, memoir, whatever the genre happens to be. Cool. Uh, as a bit of housekeeping, as Becca mentioned, uh, by the time this thing started, we actually had something close to 2,300 submissions. So I was up until the end just trying to find a, a good uh, spread of stuff. Of course, we won't get to, we're not going to get to everything. We're going to probably spend a little bit of time on each one. So, you know, we'd love to get to all of them. But really, we, we don't want to be on here for the next three weeks nonstop. Um, however, I have done my level best to pick uh, a range of genres, types of openings, so hopefully no matter what sort of story or book you're writing, there'll be something that you can learn from with everyone. Um, okay, uh, with that in mind, uh, do you want to get on with it? I would love to, yeah, let's do it. Okay, first of all, uh, let me get to our first one. I'm excited. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, croissants, coffee, and unspoken thoughts filled the hour and a quarter flight from Paris to Perpignan. Perpignan, am I saying that correctly? Yeah, probably. I hope. Okay, I'm sorry if I've offended anybody by just mispronouncing this town name. Um, so this feels very punchy and very sort of up and light, which is uh, sort of contraindicated uh, by this unspoken thoughts, right? There's like a, a heaviness to that little piece of the trifecta, croissants and coffee, so light, so um, 
so French, so uh, so easy breezy. And then we have the weight of these unspoken thoughts and that's what fills the hour and a quarter flight. Um, you know, I, I find that uh, intriguing. It definitely feels like women's fiction, maybe romance to me. Do we have a genre on this, Martin? Uh, this is literary fiction. Lit fic, okay. Um, you know, it possibly, yes. Uh, you know, literary fiction is a, is a sort of stylistic marker. It's not necessarily an independent genre all the time. You know, within your other genres, we can find literary styling. Uh, so, you know, I think this is, this is nice. Uh, I certainly want to know more about the unspoken thoughts. It feels both it, it almost feels like whatever characters are in this scene are sort of keeping secrets from each other. And I am intrigued by that. So I, I think this is pretty successful, a really good start, both to whatever this piece is and to our hour together. Amazing. Cool. That was uh, from Ron Sherry, uh, the novel, A Small Betrayal. All right. Okay. Let's hit up our next one uh, from S.E. Stahl. Oz hung from the decorative railing of the clock tower by his fraying bootlaces, and everything was going according to plan. I also find this very intriguing. I love this small detail of the fraying bootlaces. Um, it adds this sort of pressure around how long Oz will be able to hang on with that. It's just that little hint of a ticking clock in the background, which is so important in any genre. Um, but it's just that little suggestion that maybe Oz is not as safe as, you know, he might feel if everything's going according to plan. So I really like the tension between that little detail and this broader claim that everything is, you know, just fine. Um, you know, I wonder if switching the position of this of these um, independent clauses might help the overall tone of the sentence. So perhaps everything was going according to plan, either maybe a colon or comma as. Um, Oz hung from the decorative railing of the clock tower by his fraying bootlaces. I just, I guess the and, yeah, Possibly that I, it's not a perfect fix. I guess in in the original version of the sentence, and Mar, you don't have to go back to it, but yeah. um, it, that idea that these two things are just concurrently existing without a relationship to each other uh, was a little bit awkward for me. So we want to. Oh, there you go. The magic of television. Um, you know, is is are the Frank bootlaces part of the plan? Right. So I, I think. I would maybe like to know how Oz's situation right here relates to the plan. So, um, you know, is it despite the fact that Oz hung from the decorative, was hanging from the decorative railing? Was it, um, you know, is, is that part of the plan? Is that contrary to the plan? Is he rolling with the punches? I guess, look, I'm intrigued. So you're doing something right. Uh, but I think showing a better, um, better relationship between the two halves of this whole would help the overall tone of the sentence. Cool. Uh, thank you. That was a, a The Rebel Watchmaker and the Sands of Time, uh, a fantasy. Mm. Uh, I love that title. It's Rebel great. Watchmaker. Oh, just one thing to mention. Uh, the ones we picked here, like there's sort of a few internal rules I sort of chose for myself. We don't want to spend the entire time fixing spelling and grammar. So if yeah. things were a little bit hoiky on that front, I tend to gloss them over. Um, but largely we wanted stuff that was like, you know, a range of styles. So if yours gets picked, it doesn't mean we hate it. doesn't mean we necessarily love it. And similarly, if yours doesn't get picked, it doesn't really mean anything. So uh, please don't be offended if we choose you or we don't choose you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a totally neutral system for choosing and I don't choose. So please don't ask me on, don't DM me and ask me why we didn't pick your line because I don't know, I'm not in charge. <laughs> Okay, this next one's from Sarah. It was just another ordinary Sunday. Mm, this is just another ordinary sentence. You know, there, we just need so much more information for this to be an engaging sentence. And, um, you know, we're starting with the pronoun it, very bland and incredibly, it, it, the function of this word it is to replace more specific words 
right? And so you have to really question, what am I saying to my reader when I begin with a word that only signifies other words? Mm, it's not the most powerful um, narrative position to take. So I, I think this just needs so much more. Um, you know, the Sunday when X happened was, uh, you know, just like any other Sunday. I mean, and I don't even know what an ordinary Sunday means to this narrator or in this world. Too many questions, not enough engaging detail. I say this is a miss. All right. But thank you very much, Sarah, for sending that in. That's from Mary's Crazy Romance, uh, a young adult novel. Um, here's the next one from Lois Stanfield. If I had a tail, would you like me better? <laughs> so I, I usually, uh, you know, so, sort of longtime watchers of the series will know that I usually discourage you from starting with dialogue out of context, because it's really hard to connect to dialogue out of context. This is really funny, I think. I mean, okay, it's funny if this is a novel for adults or even YA, if it's contemporary. It's, I guess, less funny if this is like a picture book, you know? Um, do we have do we have a genre or audience yeah, yeah. It's, on this? Uh, for the love of a horse, I think it's a memoir of someone who's like horse crazy. Oh yeah, okay. Um, then I think that is maybe sad and funny, or maybe we're about to see an argument unfold. So again, there's no context, so I have so many questions. But this is an interesting enough snippet of dialogue that I'm not bored by it, and that is really one of the big. Um, problems with a lot of dialogue that opens, um, you know, novels is that it's just not very exciting. So I think this, this is funny and interesting and I would keep reading. So I actually think this is perhaps that unicorn, an exception to the rule. You heard it first, Lois, <laughs> the unicorn of the first sentence. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for sending that one in. This next one's from uh, A.M. Buck. Lydia Farouk was late for the U.S. District's first harvest in 400 years, need a comma there, and she didn't know what to say because a single word could kill and she had no clue how to stop it. This is like three sentences minimum. I mean, I stopped counting. This is a run on. Uh, there are way too many ideas in here. And because there are so many ideas, we're just sort of wading through the sentence, right? Just sort of slogging through and trying to figure out where it's going to end, you know? Um, every sentence in your novel needs, or memoir, or in your book, just needs a sense of propulsion, a crescendo. And um, this doesn't have one. It just meanders and collects words. Um, so I would say, you know, what do you need us to know about Lydia in this moment? What is the most important thing happening to her at the start of this book? And just tell us the one thing um, you know, there's an, a saying uh, that we used to sort of teach to new yoga instructors at the yoga studio where I used to teach in New York City. And it was, um, know many things, teach one thing. So I, I think it's just you have way too much going on here. And there's so much you want to tell us and teach us as readers right away. But you just have to choose the one thing and teach it well. And then, you know, you'll have us along for the ride and you can twist us into all different shapes but you have to catch our attention first with a unified idea. And so this needs to be really pared down to one notion. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, uh, AM, for sending that one in. That was from Tempted uh, Science Fiction. Uh, okay, uh, while you take a sip, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, folks at home, if you're enjoying this so far, to perhaps uh, give this video a like and maybe even subscribe to Reed Z's YouTube channel. Uh, okay, enough of a plug there. It is our next one uh, from W.J. Taylor. Even with all the protection and scrutiny provided by the Secret Service, SS, that surrounded each of the nine United States Supreme Court justices, dangers were still possible. Um, get rid of the abbreviation for Secret Service. It's not necessary to teach with such a heavy hand. Speaking of no many things, teach one thing. You know, you don't have to be so forceful. Uh, one might assume that since this is a, a very um, common 
organization, right? Everybody, this is sort of part of common knowledge. So I, I don't really think you need to teach us what an abbreviation is. Um, I'm also 100% for... sure that the Secret Service don't call themselves the SS. Yeah, that was my next point. <laughs> um, when I hear SS, I don't think uh, US um, public servants, I think of Nazis. And so I think you're sending a mixed message. Um, <laughs> Even with all the protection and scrutiny provided by the Secret Service that surrounded each. So um, when you're talking about people, the, that turns into who, right? So we're not talking about the Secret Service, the agency. We're talking about the individual people who protect these nine uh, justices. And so it should be who, not that. So even with all the protection and scrutiny provided by the Secret Service, agents who surrounded each of the nine United States Supreme Court justices, dangers were still possible. This is also a, a broad generalization, right? Of course, dangers were still possible. Otherwise, there would be no need for the Secret Service. Um, so this is just a sort of fact wrapped up in narration. It is not especially compelling. Show me the danger. Don't tell me it exists. And since we probably can't see all nine justices at the same time, I would focus on one Secret Service agent protecting one justice um, and, and really get specific. Go out the other door and tell daddy Chacha's awake. Go out the kitchen door. He's in the backyard. Well, find him. <laughs> then she's going to cry for a minute. <laughs> Hi, oh, everyone. No. My toddler's awake. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. She was napping. I know, but you know what? This is, this is, this is me time. Oh. My husband's on it. Everybody, okay. <laughs> don't don't call child protective services. Husband to the rescue. Today. Everything's Someone fine. To the rescue. Everything's fine. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so <sighs> that one was uh, "Supreme Death: uh, A Political Thriller" by W. J. Taylor. Thanks for sending that in, Jay. Uh, okay, let's move on to our next one from Betsy Woods. My mama died peculiar. I like this line. Uh, you guys uh, probably know by now that I sort of have a penchant for short lines. And I would say um, this one has such a strong sense of vernacular and has a, such a strong voice. Uh, it's very intriguing. And of course, it presents a central mystery, which is how did this woman die and what was so peculiar about it? Um, I love it. I think it's perfect and I wouldn't change a thing. Great. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, that was from The Alfalfa and the Omega, a YA novel. That is also really funny, and I love the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, the next one is from John Campbell. Austin is as deep in the heart of Texas as you can get, but North Austin and South Austin, separated only by the width of the Colorado River, are worlds apart. Huh. You know, this started out as another sort of straightforward fact, and there there is a lot of factual information in this um, sentence, but that little twist at the end, this sort of subjective assessment of these objective facts is is wonderful and really, really interesting. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of this. I think this is nice. North Austin and South Austin. Do these need to be fully capitalized? I, well, it kind of seems like they do, right? Because we're, but I guess, I'm not really sure. I'd I have to consult. Yeah. If I'd it's have the to name, consult my Chicago manual. I know North London if, and South London are certainly capitalized. Yeah. I, I, my instinct says that this should be, um, or you could sort of work around it by saying, but the Northern and Southern halves of the, of the city separated only by the width of the Colorado River or Worlds Apart, but I but they're totally separate. Like are these are these separate postal codes? I don't know enough about specific Austin geography to comment on this, but I guess I would just say to the author, make sure that you're doing your due diligence and seeing how these um, places are annotated. Um, and like I said, I would check my Chicago manual for you, but it's propping up my laptop, so <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I like that one. Thanks, John Campbell. That was Wait on the Ripper, W-A-I-T-E. Uh, it is a fantasy, I guess, an urban fantasy novel. Okay. Neat. Cool. Uh, here's a next one uh, from, let me get their name up, uh, 
Pasha Sotolongo. At the hardware store, she bought three full-length mirrors, oversized ones weighing 20 pounds each, and a bag of French burnt peanuts. I think we can lose the word ones. It's very clear from the use of M dashes that oversized, comma, weighing 20 pounds each, would be modifying the three full length mirrors. And so ones, which is such a, I always find such an awkward and vague word, um, is really not doing any favors here. And anytime we can just cut even the smallest little bit of narrative fat, we wanna do it. We're looking for uh, language efficiency always. At the hardware store, she bought three full length mirrors, oversized, weighing 20 pounds each, and a bag of French burnt peanuts. I love the specificity of every item here. Um, love that she was at the hardware store and got herself a snack. I like everything about this. I, I'm, I wanna know more about her, which is really the point, right? You've drawn me in. Um, kind of wanna know where the mirrors are going and where she's going and what happens next. So 100%, we've really been, uh, we've been picking some winners today, Martin. You really- I, I may have overcorrected. Uh... Yeah, these are ones that sort of like did stand out to me. Um, you're getting me comfortable and then you're going to like bring in some some tough stuff. I, I see. You're yeah. lulling me into a false sense of security. No, I get it. I mean, I think everyone's doing great, great work uh, over there, wherever they are. Uh, thanks, Pasha. That was from Cinerama, a work of literary fiction. Mm -hmm. All right. Here comes your next one, courtesy of Tree Deleski. One word, William, was etched in dark pencil on the front of the envelope he removed from his mailbox. It had hung half out, deliberately wanting to be found. Well, first of all, I would argue that anything in a mailbox wants to be found because it's in a mailbox. Uh, and people open those and take things out of them all the time. So this is not the kind of revelation that warrants use of a semicolon. Your semicolon is like big guns punctuation. It really announces, hey, this is nuanced and important, and we cannot understand the first half of this sentence unless you consider what comes after me, the almighty semicolon. So this does not warrant that, that use. Um, and if William is the person pulling the envelope out of the mailbox, which we hope he is, right? Um, I think it might be the word that is etched in dark pencil. It is, but what I'm saying is, then we have the word he. One word, William, was etched in dark pencil on the front of the envelope he removed from his mailbox. Mm. All of this indicates that William is the owner of the mailbox as well as the person whose name is on the envelope, in which case you should say that, right? Because otherwise it's confusing and ambiguous. Mm. Um, basically what I'm seeing here is that William retrieved his own mail and found an envelope addressed to himself. It's not groundbreaking, okay? Um, I, I think, you know, if, if the unique thing is that it, it hasn't gone through the post, right? It's just been placed in his mailbox. There's no stamp. Then, I don't know. I always just assume that's a, a thank you note or an invitation from a neighbor. I, I just, I, this doesn't rock my world, you know? Um, is it an envelope he's been waiting for? Does he recognize the handwriting? Can you, does some, something about the dark pencil speak to William in a, in a particular way. Find me the more interesting thing going on here other than William retrieving mail from his own mailbox. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's supposed to indicate some level of menace, perhaps, but I think you're right. It just seems to be a roundabout way of saying he found his own mail. Or it's thank you for the pie, you know, or you're invited to the Christmas party. We don't know. We, like, it's just mail in the mailbox. Nothing to be frightened of. Uh, well, cool. Thank I hope. You. Tree for sending that in. That's from Split Obsession, uh, uh, oh. mystery thriller suspense. Uh, thank you. Here's the next one uh, from Elijah Quinn. A short Hispanic woman is a paisley print dress oh. in, maybe in a paisley print dress? Yeah. Uh -huh. I was going to say that's quite a metaphor. A short Hispanic woman in a paisley print dress shakily turns the handle to her husband's bakery and is greeted with the chaotic chatter of his patrons. There's a lot of description about this woman, and yet I don't feel like I know anything ab about her, right? I know maybe how she appears, 
Um, but you know, even the the term Hispanic can apply to to many different um, countries of origin. So I, I just don't know, like, I don't know why we're sort of shorthand coding this woman's race. I don't know why the print of her dress matters. I don't, I'm unclear about why her shaking matters because she opens the door and there's just chaotic chatter. Maybe she has anxiety, but again, I don't want to start projecting about what could be going on for this woman right away. I, I think I'd like to be more inside of her experience and less, it just seems like we're standing from a distance and observing her and we don't actually know anything about her. We just know these very sort of surface level details. And so I would say, um, you know, perhaps the trick here is to get a little closer and and maybe focus on that shakiness, like where does that come from? And maybe get a little bit closer to that, to the truth of that experience instead of focusing on these you know, visual codes for what she looks like, which is kind of inconsequential. Cool. Uh, thank you, Elijah. That's from uh, A Far Out Life, historical fiction. Uh, here we go. Our next one from Andrew Wood. As soon as the carriage door swung open, Nalane knew she was in no mood for ceremony. Is Nalane in the carriage getting out of the carriage or is Nalane observing someone that she now knows? I guess it's she's in the carriage. Unless someone else is getting out of the carriage and Nalane is kind of fed up. See, I have too many questions about the logistics of what's going on here, um, which tells us that it's not quite getting there. Whose carriage, right? Or like, what is she supposed to bow? Is she facing like... Is she at the royal wedding and she's got to like sit still for the next, I don't know how long they take. They seem to take a long time. You know, I, I guess I need more detail to make this matter to me. Um, I don't know, feels fantasy-ish because of this name, which I've never heard before. It feels very fantastical to me. Do we have a, yep. do we have a, a genre on this? It's a, from the Zealots of Nalek, uh, a fantasy. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yep, I need more detail. The end. <laughs> cool, the end. Uh, the thank end. you, Andrew. Uh, okay, next one's from Julie uh, Pierce Onos. Trash Day is now my favorite day of the week, a weekly monument to my hard won peace and new beginning. Hmm. My husband likes to joke frequently that my best sport is throwing away. I love to purge things from this house. <laughs> even though I'm responsible for bringing many of them in. Um, so I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel real kinship with this character. <laughs> we need to replace this hyphen with an M dash. That's E M M dash. That's your long dash. As Martin has so aptly demonstrated, the hyphen uh, is not, is, is really just used to connect uh, compound words when we're talking about contemporary prose. Um, and there's something called an N dash, which is a slightly shorter dash. And that's really more used in, um, in nonfiction and, and scientific journaling and things like that. And you can, you can look up the subtle differences among hyphens and dashes at another time. Trash day is now my favorite day of the week, a weekly monument. So we already, we already get the trash day is weekly. So to reiterate, this seems sort of unnecessarily redundant. Trash day is my favorite day of the week. Trash day, a monument to my hard won piece and new beginning, awkward, is my favorite day of the week, right? So we want to, again, language efficiency. We want to avoid repeating ourselves, especially for a quotidian detail like day of the week and weekly. So maybe modify trash day so that its uh, description as the weekly monument to hard won piece and new beginning is close to the noun that it modifies. Very important for the clarity of your prose. Trash day, comma, a weekly monument to my hard won piece and new beginning. Mm. Nick's the weekly. Trash day, comma. A monument to my hard won piece and new beginning, comma, is now my favorite day of the week. You don't even need now. We assume that it's now, unless you tell us it's not now. Uh, so I, I think this needs some tweaking, but it's interesting enough that someone enjoys trash day. I mean, great, I guess. We're doing some kind of reno. There's got to be some kind of purge happening. And I'm interested in that. 
Uh, someone's asked whether monument is the correct term. Can a day or like uh, a ritual be a monument? Um, I think that she is basically, or I'm sorry, I, I think that the, um, why did I code this as sort of feminine? I don't know. Um, yeah, a day can be a monument to something because it's not the like day of the week. It's not like saying Wednesday is a monument. It's saying the specific things that thing that happens, trash day. I think it can work. Yeah. I'm happy yeah, it. it doesn't really bother me. I mean, I understand what it means and I think everybody else does, right? Martin, you understood what this person meant, right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's literally a metaphor. Yes. It is. Uh but um yeah, I don't I think this is fine. Cool. I mean, is it like does it totally line up perfectly? Like, well no, cuz trash day is mutable and a monument we could say is everlasting. But I I'm going to give people the benefit of the doubt that this might go somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, like we can't really micromanage people's language in that way because like we won't, we're only seeing the one sentence, you know? Um, so I would, I would let that stand. I would let that go at least for now, maybe in a line edit, I might, you know, um, finagle it a little bit, but uh, for, for our purposes today, I think it works. Well, thank you, Julie. That's from her memoir, Less Lonely Alone. Uh, here's our next one from Eric C. Bailey. The patrol moved slowly through the otherwise tightly packed arboreal forest on the faintest of paths. Remember that thing I just said about keeping your modifiers close to the nouns or verbs that they modify? You should do it. Um, so moving slowly through a tightly packed forest makes sense. So it's not the otherwise tightly packed like that. I don't know that that makes sense. I guess the fact that the patrol is moving at all is a contrast to the trees, but that is not the, that's not the dichotomy you're setting up here. What you're setting up here is that the patrol is moving slowly through the otherwise tightly packed arboreal forest, but it's the patrol is moving slowly precisely because the forest is tightly packed. Um, are there kinds of forests that are non-arboreal? I I guess I don't know enough about the urban jungle. Alternative forests. <laughs> <laughs> you know how like a desert can be a place where it's cold. A desert doesn't always mean sand. You can yeah. have you know. So like maybe there's a maybe there's something I don't know about forests. I'm open to that. But it almost feels like arboreal forest is a smidge Cause competitive. Because you want to sort of show that the the reason why it's tightly packed is for the trees, I guess. Do you need something there to indicate that? Right. But I guess, like, I wouldn't assume a tightly packed forest is full of bodies. <laughs> right? Like, I don't I don't think that I would assume that. Um, the toddler that woke up is now trying to break into my office. So it's, just <laughs> my, <laughs> it's a little chaotic here. Um, so, yeah, I this feels redundant to me. And also, it is when you open on something happening really slowly, I just feel like it, it in instantly sort of immerses your audience in a kind of narrative molasses. And I just don't feel compelled by that. So I would maybe rethink this. All right. But still, thank you, Eric, for sending that in uh, from horror fiction, zombies, a novel. Okay, or there's like maybe zombie forests. That could, that's like totally a thing, I bet. Like a petrified forest, I think, is a thing. Uh, that sounds really <laughs> scary. <laughs> this next one's from Hallie uh, Broncuccia. To be alone when you know others are nearby is one thing. To be alone in an empty world is another thing entirely. Uh, so this is where we actually do need a semicolon, right? Uh, so we would want to replace that comma with a semicolon. I love that the that there is no other punctuation here. I think that it sort of reflects the loneliness and 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 sort of spare, sparse feeling in in the line itself, in the meaning of the line. I guess the challenge that I'm facing with this is that no one is debating that being alone when others are nearby is different from being alone in an empty world. This isn't revelatory. So again, even though I think that that mark that that uh, the structure here works better with the semicolon, I, this is just two generalizations smushed back to back. 
and generalizations are not super interesting. So you have to bring the lens in closer and, and get more specific because otherwise you're just kind of telling me what I already know. And I already know, you don't know what to tell me. Uh, so I, I think this needs to get in a little closer, a little deeper, and uh, you might find a little bit more success there. It sounds desolate and depressing. Is it sci-fi or sci dystopian? What is it? Uh, it's sci-fi. Sci the road ahead. Is looking bleak from, from here. So <laughs> <laughs> I hope it leads to other people. Yeah, I guess like maybe the intention is, yeah, to show how precisely lonely the character is. But this character or the narrator seems to have taken such a distant view to it that you're so far away from the emotion of it. Yeah, it's, it really lacks that sense of personal investment. You know, this is just sort of <laughs> sort of a personal, um, it's a really personal observation coming from a great distance. And so we want personal observations to come from very little distance between, you know, the narrator and, and, and what they're, and how they speak to us. Cool, Hallie, thank you so much for sending that one in. That was uh, science fiction. Here's your next one uh, from uh, a writer known only as Sek. And saris poured forth to the teacher like flowers to a singer on a stage after a great performance. <laughs> I can't decide if it's supposed to be funny, if it's so formal as, as sort of a humorous device, or um, or if or if it's taking itself really seriously. What's the genre on this? Uh, it is YA. Okay, so that I, so now I think it is trying to be funny, and in that case, I think it it actually is really funny. Um, I don't know why we would start with the with and with a conjunction, unless not because of some grammatical rule, but just because it it is startling. Like we've just sort of been dropped into the middle of an ongoing, um, you know, piece of narration. So. Saris poured forth to the teacher like flowers to a singer on a stage after a great performance is a really solid, solid um, analogy and a really funny, great sentence. So and unless this is, unless there's something going on within the narrative um, with poetry or with like mimicking something about what they're studying with this teacher, I would say next the end. But I think this is quite charming. Fantastic. That's uh, from the book Garden. Uh, by Sec. Well done. Thank you for sending that one in. Uh, everyone's been asking how much longer this is going to go on for. Uh, I think we'll just aim to go, we'll aim to finish this like on the hour uh, and get through as many as we can get through. Uh, but yeah, of course, as we mentioned, over 2,000, we're not going to get to all of them, hopefully. Uh, fingers crossed uh, you win the scratcher here and we pick yours. But if not, uh, there's plenty of great stuff. Oh, well that's a great segue for my announcement. Can we do that now? Because it's yeah, almost, sure, it. you told me around 40 minutes. I think we should make my announcement. Okay, so this is my announcement. Uh, there are so many of you whose lines we don't get to during these live broadcasts. And so starting uh, June 1st, which is, when is it, Tuesday? Monday, starting Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday, I am going to be posting a critique of one first line. Per day. So you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. My handle names are in this um, graphic and my DMs will be open to your first line. So I will, you can tell me whether or not you want to be tagged. I am not going to, you know, I'm just going to repost, the, I'm going to post the line and my feedback one a day, every day um, in June. And you'll see them on my Twitter and my Instagram feed. So I hope that you will, you know, be brave. And of course, uh, you know, grace us with your first line. I, it's very possible that I will get a lot of lines, how many of you and just the one me, but I am going to try to get through 30, maybe more, maybe there'll be bonuses. I don't know. So uh, throw your hat in the ring and follow me on those socials and send me your line. And I would, you know, maybe maybe we'll get to you that way. Great. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, I'll drop in uh, Becca's uh, tags at the uh, in the comments while she goes over these next ones. So don't worry if you don't get it here. Thank you. Otherwise, just Google her. It's, it's on there. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's get to the next one. This one's from Catherine Graham. Catherine. 
After 20 years of exhaustive chasing, tonight will be the night I bring the fairy godmother to justice. Yes, I love this. Um, exhaustive chasing. It's a little awkward, right? Because it's really, it, you would make an exhaustive search, meaning you searched in every place. But exhaustive chasing is not quite the same thing. And I think if we really, really started to parse the meaning of that, it's it doesn't quite add up to the meaning that you want. Um, so I think you need to replace exhaustive with something else. Uh, and maybe even chasing, right? Maybe what about exhaustive pursuit? <laughs> that gives more of that leave no stone unturned vibe. So maybe after 20 years of exhaustive pursuit, tonight will be the night and I think also tonight will be the night, redundant language efficiency. Tonight, I bring the fairy godmother to justice. I like that. Is this YA? What is this? Uh, this is fantasy. Could be YA. Uh, it's Starfire Express, a flame of fey and fang. What? Uh, Wait, I'm sorry. Is that the whole title? Yes. A Starfire Say Express. it again. Starfire Express, I think could be the name of a series. That's it. Right, okay, and then what's the rest of it? A flame of fey and fang. So a flame, I guess, is the uh, maybe an in-world term for a story. And then fey, like, as in fairies, and then fang, as in maybe vampires or werewolves. Got it. Um, that's a mouthful. I was totally fine with just the one title. And also, I wouldn't put a comma after tonight. While we're fixing things, we just want to be precise. Mm. Right. Fix that there. There you go. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sending that one in. This next one is from Isabel. I'm a little sarcastic. Actually, I'm very sarcastic, and I blame that on being born and raised in England. Um, sarcasm is not exclusive to England, and if anything, I would say globally, the, the English are, no, are known for dry wit, uh, but that's a little different than sarcasm. So I, I'm okay. Like, I guess the, really the thing here would be show, don't tell. Um, you know, I could say I am very tall and I could stand up from this chair and you would see that I'm five foot one and a little bit. So, uh, you know, just because we say it doesn't make it so. I'm way more invested in a character that can show me their sarcasm than tell me about it. Cool. The end. Uh, the end. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I need a bell. I need like a little hotel bell. Next, please. So that yeah. I can be like, ding. Next you just, one. So you can pretend to swipe the screen and I'll... Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, I Isabel. have a hotel bell for my conference. I'm going to bring it out next time. And like, that's... Yeah, I, I think I had a friend who had one of those at home. It's a pretty obnoxious, obnoxious accessory to have... Uh, you know, at my writer's time. conference, I lose my voice every year that we do the conference. And uh, so to get everybody's attention, instead of just yelling, hey, 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 repeatedly, I now wear a microphone and ring this bell. And by the end, I've got, you know, 50 adults who respond with Pavlovian efficiency to the sound <laughs> of this little high-pitched bell. It's great. <laughs> uh, thank you, Isabel. That was uh, from I Can't Help It, I'm English, uh, their series of <laughs> nonfiction humor essays. All right, this one's from Malika. Hasib was panicking, pacing the corridor of the hospital like a prey fleeing from the predator. Um, so we wouldn't say a prey unless you wanted to say a prey animal. But again, that's a bit awkward. So you could just say like prey fleeing a predator. But again, that's a little hackneyed. I feel like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I see that a lot. Um, I, I also am not sure that pacing back and forth in one place is anything like prey fleeing from a predator. Because if prey decides to just run back and forth in one place, it's going to die. Uh, so I think this is not getting to the heart of the image you're trying to capture. I think what image could evoke panic? Uh, I think you need a little bit more, a little bit more thought into what the back half of this sentence looks like. Yeah, because I'm getting the impression 
you know, the idea of pacing it feels like a predator prowling, maybe kind of slow. Wow, and that's like a menacing. Creepy. That's like a menacing kind of prowl. Yeah. I definitely don't think a person is prowling yeah. because predators don't panic. So I, I also don't love the use of these progressive verbs here. Um, I would almost want to see Hasib paced the corridor, paced the hospital corridor in a panic, comma, analogy. Yeah, that makes sense. It does make sense. Cool. Thank you, Malika. That was from The Dance of Souls, Ding, uh, a horror. Uh, our next one's from Joshua D. Dinman. Whoops, just wait. Among the art community of Delft, Johann von Cleek was considered both a genius and a fool. Is this fiction? Yes. Uh, okay. So this is fine. I It's a little dry for me. I would love to focus in on, a, on an anecdote on an anecdote, sort of something to show us this genius and fool both um, characterization that Johan has been given by the art community of Delft. This feels just like a straightforward fact. My first instinct was, is this nonfiction or is it fiction? So that um, can have a purpose, right? It's good that things feel grounded in reality, but I guess uh, I would rather you start with something like Johan van Cleek um, or the, the, the art community of Delft um, told and retold the story of the time Johann von Cleek did a thing that, you know, did the thing that was both genius and foolery. So I guess, again, more show, less tell. Ding! Thank you. Uh, that was from Van Cleek's Jew, uh, literary fiction. I'm sorry, what? Van Cleek's Jew. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to change that title. Um, am I, yeah, I don't, that's not a, that doesn't sound good. As uh, a Jewish person, I would say being anyone's Jew feels a little pejorative. I don't love that. I would maybe switch that up a little bit. Not my fave. Yeah, hopefully it's done with intent, but yes, yeah, definitely something to consider. Uh, yeah, if my first instinct is, huh? I think that I am perhaps a target audience member here, considering that I am a reader of literary fiction and a Jewish person. Uh, and that gives me the heebie-jeebies. So maybe <laughs> change it. All right. You, you heard it first, uh, Josh. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> uh, this next one, I'm going to preface by saying that it's from a picture book, because uh, that may affect how you wish to. Always good to know. <laughs> We had that one about the talking dog, and I feel like knowing it was from a picture book was important last time. I'm going to lasso Santa Claus. Don't care how lively and quick. I'm going to finally be the one to capture old Saint Nick. Uh, yeah, okay. You know, the thing about picture books is that they're for young readers. I have two young readers in my home, and so uh, we have so many picture books, I can't get rid of them. Um, we're just drowning in picture books. And the thing about them is that when the grammar of a picture book is wonky, it teaches young readers this sort of faulty grammar. They're very impressionable, right? They pick up on this language. So gonna, I don't feel great about it, right? If I'm flipping through this book in the store as a parent and I'm thinking about buying it, that's going to stop me a little bit uh, just because I'm looking for words that are familiar to my young reader. And I'm, I'm just sort of looking for a certain comfort and familiarity to the prose. So I, I'm not sure how successful that is. I'm sure other um, parents of young readers might feel differently, but that's sort of my, my instinct is that I would probably pass over this if I were, uh, you know, looking through books and I in a bookstore just just because of the language. Yeah. Uh, one other thing to sort of note: we had a webinar earlier this year. Uh, where we talked to uh, a picture book editor, uh, and one of the things they brought up was the fact that, um, yeah, picture books these days, the majority of them don't have verse and don't have rhyme, and sometimes I think a lot of new writers feel the need to rhyme, and that can occasionally hamstring them. Uh, 
where you do, you know, you know what the end of your rhyme should be. And so you end up sort of crowbarring some stuff in just to make the rhyme work. Whereas all they're really looking is to be told, you know, a really lovely story. And the idea of lassoing Santa Claus feels like it stands on its own. Sure does. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I agree. I also think I don't see many semicolons in our picture books here. <laughs> you know, I still do see a lot of rhyming. I mean, maybe I'm just buying older books, but when I think, but I also see rhymes in, in a, in a, um, in a quatrain format, not necessarily these sort of two line rhymes. So I, I don't know, I guess deep dive the market and see what you're seeing. I also will say, I tend to believe that holiday books do tend to rely more heavily on rhyme. True. Unless they're like the Polar Express, right? Unless it's like a, a big story, a more sort of narrative um, picture book. The shorter picture books do tend to go heavy on rhyme when it comes to all the holidays. But again, one reader of small children's books with children. So I don't, it's just my opinion. Thanks, Robin. Uh, that was from a book, uh, I'm Gonna Lasso Santa Claus. A great title for this. <laughs> Uh, here's the next one from Troy Sebastian. Kaylin, Keelan, Keelan struck the third name from the parchment, then grabbed the head by the blood soaked hair and tossed it into the wagon with the others. Huh. These are, yep, thanks for that. Uh, you can get rid of the M dash totally, and we can treat then as. Um, a conjunction here. So it can be parchment comma then. Kaelin struck the third name from the parchment, then grabbed the head by the blood soaked hair and tossed it into the wagon with the others. Let's see, the third, the parchment, the head, the blood soaked, the wagon, the others. It's a lot of does. Problem. It's a lot of articles. It's a lot of pointing. Right, the and a are articles. They point at things. The thing, the 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 the. And I feel very poked in the in the side by this whole sentence. Uh, I also don't think these, like, even though these actions happen in sequence, they don't inform each other, and so they shouldn't necessarily be unified in a single sentence. Um, so I think this needs some retooling. Cool. Thanks, Troy. Uh, that was from the untitled science fiction novel. Uh, thanks for sending that one in. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, from Keith Patterson. Like any aspiring comic, Gulliver Keyes was eager to try out material anywhere people would listen, even while spread-eagled and strapped to a physical restraint board with an audience behind a two-way mirror. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this is funny. It's very strange and very intriguing. It's well punctuated. It's grammatically sound. It's a little weird, but I'm not going to fault you for it. You know, I think this works. Um, you know, strange, but fine. I guess that's my final verdict on it. Can they uh, use that for the back cover? You know, let's talk about it. <laughs> Strange, but fine. I mean, sure, why not? <laughs> like, I find the thing is, like, whenever you sort of have to make up, like, a name for a sort of fantasy book, it can sometimes feel really out there. But for some reason, Gull of the Keys kind of works for me. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's just one of those names, right? Is this, what is this, a, is this fantasy? It's fantasy uh, from the book oh. Zebulon. Okay, that sounds like science fiction-y to me, right? Any words that start with a Z sound tend it's to an X. make... Oh, it's an X, but it's a Z sound, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And so any any of those, um, those tend to sound very sci-fi to me, but again, just personal bias. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, this one's next, next one's from Zainab. The first time I fell in love was in 2005 when I saw Jack Tell Rose, you jump, I jump. I feel you. Um, we always want to put a comma after a year. So throw one in there for Zainab. The first time I fell in love was in 2005 when I saw Jack tell Rose, you jump, I jump. Yeah, great. I think this creates instant kinship with those of us born, in, you know, uh, who experienced the Titanic 
madness. I mean, I knew people that had seen that like 11 times in the theater. And when you just think of the sheer number of hours committed to that experience, it's yeah, real dedication. A, I think I was 13 when that came out and uh, it was really like peak Leo for like girls my age. Yeah, it was peak Leo, though I remember feeling very like really eye rolly about like the the collective intake of breath in the theater when he like, <laughs> you know, that first it like zooms in on him. And I think he's like under a flop of his own hair and he like, you know, looks up with one eyeball and everyone's like, <laughs> his eye. And I just remember being like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love this. I think it's it's just the right amount of nostalgia. It doesn't take itself too seriously. And there's some distance, right? We know that this person is looking back on who they were at that age and 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 sort of understanding something about themselves because of it. And I, I really like that. I think this is great. Fantastic. That was from a romance novel, Arranged Slash Love. I like that title too. Awesome. I love that title. Uh, great. Thank you, Zainab, for sending that one in. This one is from Susan Rosenbluth. At five in the morning, the last thing Alex Waldman expects to see is a middle-aged jeweler on Ocean Avenue breaking his own store window. Very intrigued. I don't know how Alex knows that the person breaking... I guess Alex is familiar with the owner. That has to be the answer, right? Mm. I guess then my question is, why doesn't he use his name? At five in the morning, the last thing Alex Waldman expects to see is John Smith on Ocean Avenue breaking into, oh, breaking his own, breaking his own store window. I don't know that little, it, it feels like there's like Alex knows the owner, but also calls that person the middle aged jeweler. So there's just a little bit of disconnect between who Alex knows and how well they know them. So I guess if you can bridge that gap a little bit, this would be a little bit tighter. Cool. Thank you, Susan. That was from Blurred Vision uh, Fiction. Uh, oh, and Susan is uh, actually here as well. Hello, Susan. Hi, Susan. Thank you. Uh, all right. Here's our next one from Judith. By the time I was five years old, I had already divided the world into good or bad, mean or nice, and I stuck with some version of this dichotomy for most of my life. You know, I think that it's very typical for children to understand the world in these terms. Children are black and white thinkers. It's, it's, it's really part of childhood, the good guy, the bad guy, right? We set up these dichotomies for children all the time. And so I think that the, there's a lot of time spent establishing that dichotomy when you can actually pretty safely assume that most people would understand it. If you said, um, I, for most of my adult life or for, for most of my adult life, I've, um, adhered to the, you know, child like belief or the, my childhood belief that the world can be divided into good or bad, mean or nice, you know? So I just think, this is a good idea, but the execution is really clunky and slow. And we spend a lot of time teaching people what they already know. Okay. So I, I think the, the notion here is interesting, but the, the belief at five years old is not interesting. That's almost universal. The belief in adulthood is interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. I like that. Good. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and that was from uh, Judith Owens Manley from the memoir The Origins of Outrage. Uh, I love that title. That's a like, we, so it's a great title. We've seen really some great good. titles here. Uh, yeah. And look at the one more. Uh, I think we can try squeeze two more in. Why not? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> right, this one's from Lizzie Eldridge. Ignacio Ramirez Rivera quickly became Nayo thanks to his older sister who deliberately simplified his name in response to his arrival in her world. Um, we would need Nayo to be in quotations to signify that it's a nickname and not that he became another person. Thanks to his older sister, Kama, who deliberately simplified his name in response to his arrival in her world. Because that whole phrase, from who to her world, modifies older sister. So it's, it, that's why we need that um, little comma there. I think this is interesting and fine. I'm sort of intrigued by uh, this newcomer to his sister's world and what that means, whether that is 
like a fantasy other world or whether it's just an immigration to a, a new place. So I, I think this is nicely done. Great. Thank you. Uh, that was from Duende, a historical fiction. All right. And let's finish with one more from Joyce Walsack. Uh, if I can get this up. Mothers lie to their daughters, Percy. Okay. I mean, yeah, we totally do. Again, this feels like a fact. I don't know what to make of this name, which is strange and feels purposefully obtuse, to be honest. Uh, my son and I are reading Percy Jackson right now. Um, and that's a sort of shortening of Perseus. And that feels organic and germane to the genre, which is YA. And it feels like a totally valid nickname. But the spelling of this, Percy, this way, feels like a weird nickname. And I don't know what I'm supposed to make of it. So again, more detail. Love to know a specific lie. Uh, I would love to know more context, who Percy is, who is, you know, telling it like it is. Uh, so I definitely need more information here. Great. Thank you. That was Joyce Walsack, uh, The League of Curious Women, uh, Magical Realism. Um, I am a curious woman about that sentence. So ah, there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, that brings us to the hour. Thank you so much, Becca. Uh, I've pinned uh, the link to Becca's profile to the top. Uh, of her uh, at top of the comments there. Uh, if you need an editor and are willing to wait, uh, Becca's available at some point in the future. <laughs> I I am currently booking November, so I, I have a little. I have I have one October, and I have two spots left in November, and then my book is closed for the year. Well, in which case, I'm taking your link down and putting the link to Readsy, where we have. <laughs> Plenty of editors uh, with a slightly more open schedule. Uh, I'm sorry, but if, you know, but okay. That said, you know, catch me now. I, I have a five year calendar because oh, wow. I book so far in advance. So really, uh, you know, hit me up when you're six months out, and we'll try to try to get you worked in there because I can until 2025. So oh. you know, thanks for being here, <laughs> and uh, and and. And do participate in my little June first line frenzy bonanza because I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Uh, anyone who signed up through Eventbrite, I'll put the details for that there as well. So you'll have enough time. Do you want people to start sending you first lines before the first or do you want to be? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, right after this, I'm going to post that same flyer on my socials. And from that point forward, my DMs will be open to receive those lines. Um, I'm pretty sure it's, I'm opening the floodgates here, so I'm not going to be personally responding to everybody. You're just going to have to keep an eye on the feed, and um, you know, I will I will choose my favorites or the ones about which I have the most to say. Um, you're welcome, Susie, and thank you so much. Thank you to all of you um, yeah. for being here. This is great. I we this is our sixth readsy live first line frenzy, and this is just one of my favorite parts of my job right now. So yeah, we're always. Very, very pleased to have you on. It's always so much fun and kind of easy for me as well. Because uh, <laughs> So I'm happy with these. Uh, folks, if you're still here, please give this video a like and subscribe to our channel. There's new videos every week uh, and a webinar every other week. Uh, thanks once again to Becca. Becca, you're the best. I'll catch you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>